Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm going a little slower than I was expecting, but that's, I think, totally fine. That means we are doing a good job in interacting. So that's, let's keep this like that. Um, so in the break, uh, Professor Peskin made a great comment. So I will actually come back to that comment uh, when I show the relevant plot for it. Uh, but uh, we will probably repeat that statement when we come uh, back to it. But uh, even before going into that, uh, let me just wrap up by just mentioning one thing um, that probably you've heard about. Because I've been talking about the dark matter problem. However, we shouldn't probably skip the dark matter problem without uh, at least mentioning that there is an alternative to uh, the existence of dark matter, which is essentially just modifying our understanding of gravity. Um, there's not a single model that does this, but rather a family of models, some of which are relativistic, some are not. So the uh, initial idea uh, a while ago was uh, basically put uh, forward by Milgram. And the idea is to just modify the Newtonian dynamics at very small accelerations. So you, you already know F is equal to ma. That comes from uh, Newtonian mechanics. So you can just change this behavior to F is equal to m a squared over some uh, acceleration scale when you go to small accelerations. So imagine the rotation curve problem. Uh, if you are very close to uh, the, the center of the galaxy, this makes no difference because the acceleration is large enough. However, if you are at the outskirts of the galaxy, then you, uh, you are in the small acceleration regime. And if you assume this for a moment, then your gm over r squared becomes equal to 1 over this acceleration scale uh, squared v squared over r. And as you can see, now r squared dependence, dependence cancels, and you get a flat rotation curve by design. So by design, this definitely solves very beautifully the rotation curve problem. However, there are problems with this type of approach from two sides. First, when you solve the rotation curve problem, uh, you still have to solve the CMB problem. And then it becomes a patchy solution. You have to come up with a different prescription for each and every problem you have to solve. Then you kind of lose the parsimony uh, uh, approach. Or the fact that, for example, you, you, rem you probably remember Occam's razor, the, the idea that you have to explain something as simple as possible. Uh, so postulating one new particle that solves everything at the same time is a better idea, or at least for many people, than so, um, coming up with patchy solutions to fix many problems at different scales. However, this still does uh, uh, deserve attention because it solves the rotation curve problem very beautifully. Uh, sorry? Yes. Yeah, so this actually has its own generalistic, uh, sorry, relativistic uh, generalization uh, called uh, Tevez or something. I, 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 I really don't know much about this literature uh, because I, I only worked on dark matter, so I really don't know. But um, it's got a really nice uh, theory behind it. Uh, however, uh, as I said, Dark matter solves cosmological problems along with many other problems. Like it's essentially one for all solution. Uh, however, changing the understanding of gravity has, has to be in certain limit and has to have custom uh, ingredients in the model. Uh, so it's, it's a very different type of approach to the problem. OK, so yet another thing I, I should probably also mention uh, is the fact that uh, some of the dark matter that I have been talking about can still be just baryonic, ordinary baryonic matter that, that we know. Uh, and these are called massive compact objects. And uh, people have wondered what fraction of dark matter could be in machos, the massive compact <laughs> objects. These could be just uh, Jupiters, like exoplanets. 
uh, freely floating or around their host stars. They could be just rocks, uh, dead stars like neutron stars, uh, pulsars, and also black holes. Um, and if you just have uh, basically some of these scattered around the galaxy, they can certainly contribute to the dark matter budget of the, of the galaxy. Um, and people have carried out many experiments looking for microlensing events from such uh, compact objects. And by just looking at the occurrence rate of such uh, events, they have put upper limits on the mass fraction of the halo that can be made up by uh, compact uh, objects, non-compact objects. And depending on who you ask, the, the result is about, the answer is about 15% at, at best. So um, that's, that's the ballpark uh, value we have. Uh, however, um, it is almost obvious that you cannot actually make up 100% of dark matter using massive compact objects. Okay, so now I will just um, very briefly discuss the particle nature of dark matter without very much going into details because Tracy is going to talk about this. Um, one thing to just say is that I have only so far mentioned the gravitational aspect, gravitational interaction of dark matter. So dark matter is a hypothetical construct motivated by its gravitational interaction. However, there is so far is really no clear motivation outside this context. That is by other means of interaction, such as electromagnetism, weak interaction, strong interaction, or any other interaction that we currently may not know. Uh, it is, I think, by clear by now that it shouldn't actually interact electromagnetically anyways. However, it could have some very uh, weak other interactions. Uh, that we may not yet know. Um, so this is just a funny picture of, uh, I think, how, how, how many dark matter models there are. And I'm sure it is not an exhaustive list. You may not be able to read all of them, but they can uh, actually be uh, uh, decomposed into a couple of islands of models. A big island is, uh, are, are those models that contain supersymmetry. Because once you have supersymmetry, you have the, uh, the uh, a stable particle uh, that is predicted to exist. And that certainly is a candidate for dark matter. Uh, there are many extensions. And I have pretty much no idea about the very details of these models. Um, there are also the extra dimension models. So whenever you postulate the existence of any additional dimension, you can excite it. And once you excite it, you get particles. So there are many particles that come from those extra dimensions that could be of interest. One thing that you may have heard of is Kaluza-Klein particle uh, on the fifth dimension. That is something that uh, people have searched for. In the MSSM space, by the way, uh, or the supersymmetry in general, uh, the most obvious one is the neutralino uh, that uh, people uh, have entertained that could exist. Now, on the left-hand side, we have the sterile neutrino that I already mentioned. It is the non-active sterile uh, brother of our active neutrinos that uh, we know exist. And they make up the warm dark matter. There's also other models, uh, the little uh, Higgs model. And there's, oh, sorry, there, there's also the QCD axions. And a subset of those can actually explain the dark matter. Not all QCD axions are actually dark matter solutions but a subset of them are. Um, these are more like the wave-like dark matter. Uh, but anyways, the uh, idea is, uh, and in little x, uh, you have uh, the brother of Higgs, basically, which is a pseudo uh, um, uh, Goldstone boson. Uh, but at the end of the day, the idea is there are so many of them, and very little experimental data to actually uh, pick any of them at, this, at, at the moment. The observational evidence or observational constraints we have uh, basically come from direct detection experiments, which probe the, the coupling constant between uh, baryonic matter and uh, dark matter, and also indirect detections, where we basically look for potential products of dark matter if, if it annihilates with each other or as a, fun, as, a, as a result of collusions with uh, uh, baryonic matter. Um, 
so there is a very rich literature uh, that is the, out, uh, the, the, pro, the output product of this. And Tracy is going to talk uh, about that. Um, at the end of this talk, I will talk about only one subset of the, those results, which is the GEV access. But first, we need to talk about this uh, structure of dark matter. So when I was showing the CMB picture, I basically uh, showed the, uh, the power spectrum. And um, there are actually more plots that go with it. So on the right-hand side here, you see as a function of the scale factor of the universe, so in logarithmic scale, so this is like minus 5, means at this moment the universe uh, was 10 to 5, that is 100,000 times uh, smaller than it is today. So this is today. Uh, this is about recombination, where redshift, uh, um, the, the recombination happened at about a redshift of 1,000, so a scale factor of, log scale factor of about negative 3. So as you can see here, there are two components, well, there are three components, radiation, baryon, and dark. So uh, this line basically traces the density fluctuations in logarithmic scale of the dark matter component, and as you can see, prior to the recombination, it has much larger um, um, density contrast compared to the radiation which is coupled to the baryonic component. So once uh, recombination ends, then the radiation obviously becomes uh, free of the baryonic component, so it stabilizes. And the baryonic component, because it's uh, now non-relativistic, it just catches up with the rest of the uh, dark matter through gravitational interaction very quickly, and it just traces the evolution of dark matter uh, perturbations. So in this sense, uh, the dark matter has to be there in order for there to be enough density fluctuations. Otherwise, it's really come, uh, hard to come up with the universe uh, starting with these initial conditions here, which is about 10 parts per million, which is the typical anisotropy in the temperature, temperature, power spectrum of the CMB. Now, on the left-hand side, you just see a schematic, and I think this is an animation. So you see basically the potential wells associated with it. So there is an exchange between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And in the, C in the case of the cosmic primordial plasma, there are two components. And you can imagine them to have like different spring constants. So there are a couple uh, oscillator basically and that's pretty much why the first um, compression is much larger than the first rarefaction and uh, basically uh, Professor Peskin had a comment about that so do you want to just repeat that or uh, is this good enough or Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so basically, um, as, a, as a result of this um, uh, interaction we, we have um, ample evidence for the existence of dark matter. However, there's, there's still a lot to understand about dark matter because um, there's a lot to, um, to still solve uh, about, the, there's still a lot to learn about its spatial distribution. Uh, its abundance is one thing to learn, but how it's distributed in the universe is yet another thing that, uh, that, that's very important to set the characteristics uh, of dark matter and how it affects the universe. So this is just a schematic that shows the history of the universe. I just put this in here just make, to make sure that everyone is on the same page about where this fits in the cosmological contexts. So I have been talking about this uh, period called the hydrogen recombination, which happens at about 3,000 Kelvin at a redshift of about 1,000, and that's about 400,000 million, sorry, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So after that, we have the first stars happening in between, there's the Dark Ages, and then uh, after the first stars form, and then they start producing lots of UV radiation and, as, uh, and also X-ray radiation, they reionize the hydrogen in the intergalactic medium, and then we get the universe that we see today. Uh, however, there is also a lot of rich physics prior to that. I won't really go very much into that today. 
Um, OK, so this uh, is an animation that shows how that sound wave I was talking about is propagating in the cosmic uh, plasma prior to the recombination. So you can Im imagine these density fluctuations to start propagating at time t is equal to 0 and reaching a certain distance by the epoch of recombination. And uh, if you just single out a particular single uh, density fluctuation, that's how it looks. So it travels very fast in the beginning because the pressure and the temperature is large. That makes the speed of sound uh, really large. The speed of sound is proportional, uh, is, is, is uh, proportional to the, uh, the pressure. So that basically makes the sound, uh, the speed of the sound is really large. However, as the, um, as the temperature drops, that speed of sound also goes down, and that propagation slows down. And um, there is another figure or uh, um, GIF here, so I will start that. So here you see different components in the universe. Uh, again, uh, just the same idea uh, that initial perturbation uh, uh, just uh, spreading out from the uh, from the initial condition, and then. Uh, you see different colors, dark matter, gas, which is the baryonic gas here, the photon, which is radiation, and the neutrino component. And um, the, the message to take out from here is that dark matter basically just sits uh, in the initial condition, uh, in the, uh, uh, wherever it is, because it only gravitationally interacts, wherever, whereas the, uh, the photon and the gas, which are coupled to each other, they basically move away from the initial point, um, the density perturbation, uh, at the speed of the sound. And that's just simply because photons are relativistic and they're essentially pushing the baryon uh, density fluctuation away. Now, when recombination happens, that, uh, uh, that feature that grows here at about 150 megaparsecs in commoving coordinates, that is stalled. That basically just freezes there. And the, at later stages, uh, because the dark matter clump is at uh, r is equal to 0 still, basically uh, the baryonic component starts moving towards the dark, uh, dark matter component again. However, there is still a residual bump that remains at about 150 megaparsecs. And that feature is what we call the baryon ac acoustic oscillation. Uh, a, basically an imprint of the sound wave that propagated in the early universe. And we see this feature when we look at the two-point correlation function of the galaxies in the universe. And this is just an uh, artistic uh, way of showing that correlation, uh, that, that distance being 150, roughly, megaparsecs uh, in today's standard. Obviously, back then, it was a 1,000 times smaller. The universe was smaller. OK, so now we have these density fluctuations. I've talked about the initial conditions, how they come into existence. Um, and Another thing uh, we should probably think about is how they grow. Now, in the linear regime, they just grow through this differential equation where there's the, the second order time, der time derivative and the second order spatial derivative. They are coupled by the uh, speed of the sound. And on the right hand side, there is the source term, which is due to the density fluctuation itself. So uh, if you just uh, put the dispersion relation in, just to study it as a function of, uh, like, in terms of the Fourier components, you basically get this growth factor, d of t. Uh, it essentially characterizes how a given density fluctuation grows as a function of cosmic time, t. And uh, there are a bunch of values here, lambda sub m, lambda sub uh, sorry, sorry, omega sub lambda and omega sub m. These are the abundances of the dark energy and uh, dark matter, or actually matter in general, uh, baryonic plus dark. Um, um, and A is the scale factor. It is, it is a factor that describes how space is expanding. Um, and if you just solve this uh, growth factor for two cases, one, a universe in which uh, radiation is the dominant in the energy uh, dominant factor in the energy budget in, of the universe, and another one in which 
the universe is matter dominated. You get these two solutions. So they tell you something about how density fluctuations grow in the radiation dominated uh, in a radiation dominated universe the um, dependence is only logarithmic whereas in a matter dominated universe it is essentially a polynomial in time so uh, the density fluctuations tend to not grow strongly uh, when the universe is radiation dominated however once it becomes matter dominated so past the radiation matter equality then density fluctuations start growing fast or faster and at some point these density fluctuations in the universe um, reach a point where they start uh, collapsing due to gravitational instabilities. So just to recall the story, the universe is expanding, there's a density fluctuation which is growing linearly, and at some point uh, the, there's a turnaround, and then uh, the uh, matter collapses onto itself and so-called virializes. Virialization is a process in which the, uh, the dynamics uh, become relaxed within the uh, cluster or the, we call these halos, halos of particles and the density uh, um, contrast when it virializes is about 18 pi squared which is about uh, 178 roughly. Um, so basically you get halos that are more dense uh, than compared to the background by a factor of about 200. So that's the gravitational, spherical gravitational collapse and as a result of this we get uh, halos of dark matter particles. Uh, so, sorry, in, in general, matter particles. Um, one thing to note here is that there is a certain scale called the gene scale uh, below which this cannot happen. However, if you're above the gene scale, that is, if, if you have a, a clump of matter that is larger than the gene scale, which is, by the way, proportional to the speed of the sound, then gravitational instabilities take place and can result in the collapse of the, uh, of the halo. However, uh, at scale smaller than that, because the speed of the sound can propagate uh, very efficiently and equalize density perturbations or density contrasts, uh, this uh, gravitational collapse cannot happen. So gravitational collapse has to have very massive or uh, large um, clumps. Otherwise, you, you, you basically erase out the d density uh, fluctuations. Or at least the density fluctuations aren't enough to uh, collapse uh, uh, for for collapse to happen. Okay, so gravitational collapse, as I said, happening happens in the nonlinear regime, um, and there is there is a bunch of uh, methods to calculate the abundance of those halos in the universe. Uh, the simplest of these is called the Press-Schachter formalism. And in that, you basically calculate the probability that at early times, these uh, matter fluctuations, density fluctuations, go above a certain level in units of sigma, in units of uh, unlikeliness, basically. And then you calculate the cumulative uh, distribution function of that, and eventually take the derivative to get the number density of uh, these halos as a function of its mass. As you can see, it has an exponential drop, so that means uh, it basically increases until a point where you just can't get uh, halos more massive than a, per a certain scale. At uh, today's universe, in today's universe, that scale is about like roughly superclusters. So that means in our universe, when we look at the universe at the largest scales, the largest intact structures that we should hope to see are superclusters and have masses of about 10 to 15 solar masses. You don't actually see anything that is gravitationally relaxed larger than those. And that basically is the result of hierarchical mergers of uh, these halos, which start at the smallest scales and through hierarchical mergers end up at the largest scales. Um, I think I have a movie on that. Oh, even before coming to that. Okay, so I will show you a pretty movie soon, but before that, um, so I've talked about these halos. 
Uh, and these halos have essentially a, a profile, density profile, when they are relaxed, that's called, well, one of the models is called a Navarro Frank uh, White NFW profile. Uh, that is the profile that is very much in agreement with the M body simulations when you run these uh, simula hydrodynamical simulations. And that just looks like a power law in re uh, galactocentric radius. It just goes like 1 over R squared, roughly, at large R. And uh, there's a characteristic density scale as well. There is a C here, which is the concentration. Uh, the concentration of every halo can be different, but we have a ballpark number for them. It's like 10 to 20, roughly. Um, so we think that these gravitationally relaxed halos just look like this radial profile. Um, up to some um, triaxiality discussions, which I won't really go into, but that's like the zeroth order picture. Um, and here's the movie I promised. So th this basically is a movie of the structure formation of the universe that starts at redshift 50 and runs uh, the, mo the movie forward in time. So the redshift basically decreases, time increases. And this scale is 500 parsecs. So what you see is the, 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 cosmic, me the cosmic web, uh, which is the largest uh, which is the universe seen at the largest scales. So smallest clumps, clumps gravitationally collapse first, and then they are accreted by larger and larger and larger halos. Uh, and at the end of the day, you have halos in halos in smaller in halos. And this basically is a hierarchical process. And as smaller halos get eaten or accreted by larger halos, uh, the smallest of these actually just get uh, dynamically um, dis um, disrupted due to tidal friction. I won't really go very much into these because I really don't have time. Uh, but there is rich physics involved um, uh, in this where this hierarchical process, if you freeze at a given time, gives you a distribution over halo masses. And uh, the idea uh, here is to be able to observationally constrain this distribution. If we can do that, then we may be able to understand the particle nature of dark matter. Because as I was saying, every particle model uh, of dark, dark matter has a different assumption about its small scale distribution. So this, this small scale distribution is like the key point to pin down if we want to understand what type of model there is behind dark matter. So at the, by the end of this movie, you see now uh, many small halos. So a large galaxy, elliptical galaxy has formed. And it's got a bunch of substructure. These are smaller halos that are in orbit around the largest halo. And there are many of, of these halos, by the way, in the universe. Um, so this is just like zooming around 500 kiloparsecs of it. Um, but the observable universe is much higher, larger. So the time is now almost like 11 billion years. And as you know, the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. So I won't really wait until the very end, but this gets boring after some time. But as, so you get the, the idea. There are many substructures. Um, and uh, so, OK, maybe one thing I should mention is now, don't get me wrong, but the color here doesn't mean it's actually light. So the color here indicates the surface mass density. So you have a surface. And there is a density, mass density, integrated along the line of sight associated with every pixel. That's what you're seeing. So this most. Is all dark matter. Yes, yes, this is all dark matter. That's what I was saying. So basically, all these like small clumps, they are not necessarily giving away photons. They're only there just because we think that structure formation starts from the, from the bottom and goes to the top. And they have to be there if the cold dark matter scenario is right. However, there are many perturbations to this model that, <laughs> that, that can change things and erase this structure. And um, I will talk about uh, this problem further in my fourth lecture. OK, so GV excess. Uh, now, I will switch gears again. So far, I've talked about the dark matter problem and the structure formation. Um, in the remaining time, 
I will just mention uh, one um, project I worked with, including Tracy and my uh, PhD advisor, which is about the a possible signal associated with dark matter. So um, I think I've used this term before, but maybe haven't really explained it. One of the candidates for dark matter is called weakly interacting massive particle, WIMP. A pretty bad name um, for, for a particle. But um, so dark matter uh, particles, these dark matter WIMPs, can actually annihilate, self-annihilate, I mean. So basically interact with each other and produce particles that are in the standard model. One of which is photons. So they may basically directly go into photon, photon. Or they may go into, let's say, a quark and quark. So may, sorry, an, quark and anti-quark, like bottom, anti-bottom, et cetera. Uh, or like electron and anti, so positron. And as a result, there will be a photon shower, like gamma ray shower, uh, at the end of this process. And you may hope to detect these gamma rays high energy photons, uh, if you're lucky, out in the galaxy. That's the idea that set us forward. So this is the instrument that we used, Fermi LAT, Fermi Large Area Telescope. It's a gamma ray space telescope by NASA. Uh, it was launched into space 2009, I believe. And that, that's the uh, gamma ray full sky map that um, they measured. So you see the galactic plane, which is really bright because there are many processes producing high energy photons in the galactic plane, uh, one of which is pi in the case. So cosmic rays, for example, <coughs> just uh, produce uh, pions when they uh, collide, and then pions decay into gamma rays. So you see a lot of emission um, correlated with the uh, dust uh, and the galactic plane. Uh, there's also inverse Compton scattering, where high energy electrons just um, uh, hit uh, basically the interstellar radiation field and then scatter up the energy, the, the photon into uh, the gamma ray uh, high energy regime. Um, so uh, there's also Bremsstrahlung uh, stopping radiation that, um, that causes a lot of uh, high energy photon production. But, uh, and there's, there's, by the way, also many point sources like these pulsars that you see. Um, they populate the gamma ray sky. So after taking into account all these, um, all these components that we know they exist, uh, people uh, have figured out almost like early 2010s that there is an additional component in the galactic center called, now called the GV excess um, that, that is simply not understood using our own un our understanding of the background processes. And we try to model it using dark matter annihilation. And if you do so, you get a picture that's really neat. So the dark matter annihilation just looks like this as a function of energy uh, of the photon. That's E squared dN dE. That means it's the energy per logarithmic energy bin. And different uh, lines basically indicate the energy, the, the, the distribution that you get from different annihilation products or channels. And you also get addition uh, from Bremsstrahlung emission. So you, the tail might look different. But they're all bump-like. Uh, that's the idea. And uh, so I've already talked about this, the fact that the spatial distribution has to be NFW-like, at least. And uh, what, we do, uh, what we did was we took the NFW and then squared it, just because it's the um, it's a two-body process, and then took the line of sight integral. So that gave us a profile as a function of um, uh, as a function of the galactocentric radius, and then we use that as a template. Uh, so that template is shown here, uh, and as a function of degrees shown here, it's the, it's called the J factor. Um, and so we then modeled the gamma ray sky as a linear combination of these, in addition to the known components, and we masked out the point sources, and we got this. That's the GV excess at the galactic center, shown with red. Uh, that's, that's an excess emission that was not really understood, and still probably not understood well enough. Um, and that's very much consistent with dark matter annihilation. Um, so th this is shown in different uh, 
uh, energy bins, uh, 0 0.5 to 1, 1 to 3, 3 to 10, and 10 to 50 GeV. As you can see, it's brightest at the 1 to 3 uh, GeV band. And that's the spectrum associated with it. It's a bump-like spectrum that peaks at about 2 GeV. Um, and that's the uh, chi-squared value you get as a function of the dark matter mass. And for every uh, channel, there's a particular dark matter mass that explains this the best. Uh, for BB bar, that's basically, that sits here. That was our best model um, that, uh, that gives a mass of roughly 40 uh, GeV. Um, and <laughs> yes. Yes. No. Um, well, I actually worked in AMS uh, on on this channel, and by the time I left AMS, there was none, and I've never seen a paper on gamma rays from AMS uh, that made headlines. So I'm assuming no. Uh, AMS actually isn't uh, designed to detect photons. It's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of, of its design because it's a particle detector. So that means it can also detect photons, but it's not uh, particularly designed. It's actually designed for gamma rays uh, because it has a magnetic field, so it can actually bend charged particles. So its main purpose was to pin down the positron excess. Um, but this was something in addition. Uh, OK, so just wrapping up, I'm almost done. Um, so basically, if you just project this into the theory space now, uh, so on the y-axis, you have the annihilation cross-section. <coughs> and on the right and uh, on the x-axis, you have the, the WIMP mass. Um, these detections basically imply a certain contour on this uh, axis. And just look at this number, 10 to, 20, 10 to negative 26. Uh, roughly, actually, 2 times 10 to negative 26, especially if you look at this contour. Um, now, this number may not tell you something right away, but I'll just remind you that this is the cross-section uh, from the WIMP miracle. It's not a really good name that I really like to call it a miracle, but it's the idea that if you want to solve the electroweak puzzle, uh, the hierarchy problem, then you want a WIMP to exist uh, with a cross-section. You want a thermal history WIMP that has a thermal history that has a cross-section of about 2 times 10 to negative 26 centimeter cube per second. So that's the right number. And th when we got this number, we got super excited because like, if nature is fair to us, really, this is an exciting signal. The issue is that this is still degenerate with many astrophysical explanations. So we never claimed that this is certainly dark matter. We just said that this is very consistent with dark matter annihilation. And if it is so, then it's very interesting because it is also the right number that you expect in order to solve other problems in, 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 um, in uh, particle physics. However, the situation is not that easy because there are, as I said, many astrophysical um, sources of uh, uncertainty. First of all, we, our background models are not perfect, so that's one thing. Second, there are unresolved sources, uh, particularly millisecond pulsars in the game. And it is very likely, just given the data, that uh, the excess could just be an artifact of um, unresolved millisecond pulsars. It could also be ejection from the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, although I think it's less likely than the millisecond pulsar interpretation. So there's a chart like this, and eventually we try to say, we, we try to first uh, try to answer the question, is there an excess? Well, everyone did it, and there's certainly an excess, so the answer is, I think, is yes. But once we try to answer the question, do you really understand the residuals, it's probably no. If you say yes, then you're probably doing something wrong. And um, is it unresolved sources? Yes, it is likely that it's unresolved sources. However, I think it's really hard, just given the Fermi lat data, to say e anything either way. So I think we are at this 
uh, logical point in this flow chart diagram and we are just waiting for more data to appear so we can actually do this uh, logic flow for, uh, continue the logic flow further yes uh, what are the ideas of what those unresolved sources might be and is there any hope of resolving them yeah so so these uh, unresolved sources if they exist could be millisecond pulsars uh, millisecond pulsars um, can and should certainly exist in the galactic center. We don't see them currently, but it's likely that, uh, first of all, millisecond pulsars are old, recycled pulsars. So it is likely that during the evolution of the galaxy, pulsars uh, could migrate towards the galactic center, and there could be a population of millisecond pulsars that are faint. And because they're faint, they, may, they might be below resolution of the Fermi. So it is very likely astrophysically. Um, now, for efforts to actually understand them, there are two ways. First, you could just be looking for gamma, uh, sorry, radio wave emission from them. And people have been trying to do that, trying to come up with uh, more and more uh, complete catalogs of uh, millisecond pulsars in the galactic center. I have not seen any convincing complete catalog. So I'm, I'm yet to see uh, if there is going to be any, but there's a large effort to actually do this. Second, you could just uh, send another uh, gamma ray telescope into space with a better angular resolution, like sub GeV, better angular resolution. Then you might be in the game, but however, I mean, I, I don't know if there is going to be funding for any such gamma ray telescope soon. So I don't think there is any immediate hope of having such data. At least, at least during my postdoc, so, and probably yours as well. Okay, so I think I'm very close to the end. Let me just see if I have more, more slides. No, I don't. Okay, so uh, this is my conclusion. I'll just wrap up saying that we have this beautiful model called Lambda CDM. Uh, I, I think I've motivated you enough about why we think it's true. Uh, and that's the, well, usually people like to show this in the first uh, slide. I, I really don't, so I put it in the conclusion. So we actually don't understand 95% of our universe, really, and that's, that's really a humbling statement. Um, about 25 or 26% of it is dark matter, about 68% of it is dark energy, and rest is heavy elements like us, our Earth, rocks, etc. Uh, there's, there's also a bunch of neutrinos out there, really, energy budget-wise, it's really small. Uh, stars, about 0.5%, and there's also free hydrogen and helium, like gas, intracluster medium, etc., that also makes up about 4%, uh, really a large fraction of the baryonic matter, to be honest. But the end of the, the, the end statement is that we really make up a small fraction of the universe and we really don't understand a large fraction of the universe. With that pessimistic statement, I'll just conclude and get questions. Thanks. Sorry. Um, Yeah, um, this is, so this is a question for the particle physicists, actually. I'm not a particle physicist. Yes, we have a particle physicist, so, yes. <laughs> so, so it depends, so in order for this object to be produced and to be discovered in an accelerator, it has to have a signal in the accelerator. And unfortunately, this is a difficult case. So, now, can, can I that by Because we have to go into a little detail about what the prediction of the supersymmetry theory is. So in supersymmetry, which is where this particular object is maybe most natural, um, the, the way you build the theory is you take every standard model particle, and then it has a fermionic analog. So in particular, we're interested in neutral things. So we would take a look at the photon, the Z, and the Higgs boson. And actually, maybe I should put the W plus or minus here, too. So then there are um, a set of states, which are called the neutral and charge Let's just call them the neutral and charge 
call them uh, n and c. And the way it works is that there are four n's, and there are two c's, and of course there are n. Now, the way you produce these things at a particle accelerator, there are two ways. One way is you can have, for example, gluons producing the supersymmetric partners of quarks, and then the quarks decay to these things, to quark plus n, let's say, or quark plus c. Okay? But we know that these supersymmetric particles of quarks are too heavy to be produced at the LHC, at least in the current experiment. So this doesn't work. So the other way is to have QQ bar annihilation directly into, let's say, NN or CC, or CN or CC. Okay. Now, QQ bar to NN, at least, let, let's say, and then um, the lightest N would be the dark matter. QQ bar annihilation to the lightest n is really hard to observe because it's a weakly interacting stable particle. So it produces no signal. The way you would observe this is you have to look for um, something like QQ bar annihilation to nn, and then you radiate a gluon, and you look for a gluon plus nothing. And this is obviously a very difficult signal because there's also the process where QQ bar makes a Z boson, which goes to neutrinos. Or, um, and so this reaction is a background to this one, but it has a larger cross-section. So, um, so this thing directly is very hard to find. Okay. Now, this is the case where the dark matter is uh, it's supposed to be in the form of uh, supersymmetric particles. Yes. But in this case, it is a wind, for instance. No, but the wind is a, the supersymmetric particle is a type of wind. So now what I'm doing is taking this idea and embedding it in a complete theory. As I said before, you have to look at the complete theory. Which it's so the thing that actually does work is to look for, for example, QQ bar goes to CN or to N2N1. And then this will decay to another end one plus some observable stuff. And similarly here. And then by observing this stuff, you can have a way of discovering this reaction. Now, unfortunately, there are two cases in supersymmetry. One in which the spectrum, um, <coughs> yeah, let's go over here. One in which the spectrum looks like this, um, N1, C1, N2, and then heavier things, where, let's say, so this is supposed to be 40 G, according to what uh, we just heard. And, and so this would be maybe about 80 G. And then you go, you produce one of these, you go from here to here, you produce a lepton pair. And people have searched for that. So this case is entirely excluded. However, the other possibility, this is the so-called um, uh, Beano dark matter. Mm -hmm. But there's another case called Higgsian. So that's the case where this guy is basically the partner of the photon. But there's another case where the N1 is the partner of the Higgs boson. And in that case, the spectrum looks like this. So N1 is here. This gap is a few GeV. Here's N2 and C1. And then these guys are at some enormous energy. So these are the partners of the Higgs bosons. And these are the partners of the W, Z, and photon. OK, well, this number is too small. Um, there, the, reaction, the energy that you produce when you decay from here to here is such that those events don't pass the triggers of the LHC experiments. And so this case is totally alive. And so in this way, it's very, I mean, it's really easy to make a scenario within a supersymmetric model 
in which this particle at 40 GeV could exist. It, um, we're producing, you know, literally millions, hundreds of millions of these things at the LHC, but we don't know that. We're not able to detect them. And then there are a lot of very clever ideas about how to do that. For example, if you produce 100 million, maybe you'll produce 100,000 where these are highly boosted. And then if you have a few GeV signal, maybe you can get that highly boosted and be able to detect it. So there are ideas like that. But, um, so this is a very hard game. And, uh, so even if the new upgrade in CERN, it will not be able to. Well, the, the upgrade gives higher luminosity. Yeah. So that means that um, in these special configurations where these particles are highly boosted, there'll be more of them. And so your chances are better. On the other hand, the backgrounds are low. So you have to fight against that. But right now, the situation is that this scenario is not excused. Okay, I'm sorry for getting a little technical, no, no, here, but you. that's the complete information. Thanks. So are there other questions? All right. If not, we can just call it a day. Oh. Uh, okay, so there are many tabletop experiments. Uh, I, I really don't know the literature, but I just keep hearing that there are many tabletop experiments that are sensitive to certain uh, parameters in, at very high energies, like correction terms. Um, but directly making the jump into a dark matter candidate may not be that obvious. But at the moment, yes, there are efforts to just use uh, solid state methods to just um, understand something about particle physics at high energies. So are you going to discuss the, um, the various candidates for dark matter? No. This is, the end? This, this is end of my part. So Tracy is going to take over now. Uh, and she's going to dis discover probably pretty much the supersymmetric. Uh, uh, I mean, she worked, she actually worked on Vino and Bino, I know. Uh, so she'll she'll do that. So maybe the right way to answer the question is to say this is the situation for WIMPs. Yeah. But there are lots of non-WIMP candidates for dark matter, and I would say the leading ones today are Milli charge and Axiom. Yeah. And there, the detection methods are totally different. However, those would not produce this signal. The signal would have to be contributed to some astrophysical process. But if you, if you don't believe this, actually, I don't believe this, so <laughs> you can join me. Um, uh, well, I believe that there's a signal, but I don't believe it's dark matter. But we can talk about that later. So if you think this is not dark matter, you can look for other solutions, like Milli charge or axion, and there's a whole list of them. And every one has its own preferred detection technology. For axions, you use large, um, empty, uh, basically electromagnetic cavities with large magnetic fields. For millicharge, you use very high intensity uh, fixed target electronic cavities. And um, there's a whole catalog of them. So maybe Tracy will talk about this. Yes. Okay, so there is there is a claim to detect the 21 centimeter absorption line from the ionization. And um, they got the twice the signal than they expected, and they're explaining the cooling of this signal by the dark matter and baryon interaction. So could you please uh, comment on this, that what, is, what about the interaction between the dark sector with the baryon? Yeah, I, I don't actually do 21 centimeter cosmology, so I think I shouldn't make a comment because I really don't know the literature. I, I just probably, I, I, you know better than I do, because I only heard about the signal. Uh, but um, there's not much 21 centimeter cosmology that's related to our work. So um, we can discuss that later if you want. Again, so far, there's only one experimental paper. Yeah, I mean, and that experimental paper, I mean, I've I heard. Yeah, I've heard many bad things about it, so I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, yeah. Is this the edges? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So there's one experimental paper, and then there are 130 papers. Yeah. 
Okay, so then thanks for listening. So we'll continue with the lecture three and four.